Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. What a difference a week makes. I couldn't help but think of the smell of that ointment as she broke that alabaster box and the odor filled the room and it was the service <clears throat> of this dear lady uh, broken for us with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, God bless you for being here today. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're in the middle of, or really toward the end of these epistles to the Thessalonians by the Apostle Paul. One of the earliest churches and one of the earliest epistles written by Paul. And if you did not get one of the handouts, they're on the table next to the church there in the back. If Paul could pass these out at Thessalonica, he would. Because this is everything that he's teaching the church in First and Second Thessalonians. There's years of uh, theology and hours of Bible study in this, these two charts. Uh, they're not mine. I, I got them from someone else. So I'm passing them on to you. And that is exactly what we have been studying uh, in the book of First and Second Thessalonians. If you didn't get one, uh, get one on your way out. Get your Bible and sit down and study. And look and see what Paul was trying to teach the church at Thessalonica. They were all confused. They thought they were in the tribulation period. They thought that uh, uh, the second advent was to come. And Paul said, no, uh, the rapture is going to take place first then the seven-year tribulation, then the second advent, the Lord is going to come. So he wrote these two books to straighten out their eschatology. You see, as uh, Jimmy DeYoung shared with us, uh, so much of the Bible is filled with eschatology, studying prophecy. God wants us to know uh, the end times. He doesn't want us to be caught off guard. He wants us to know his word. So as Paul is coming to the end of his letters to the Thessalonians, in chapter 3, we've entitled this Paul's Prayer. Paul's Prayer. As you know that he shared, I shared with you last week, and as he concluded chapter 2, he shared with them that they needed to know nothing but the truth. That's what sets people free. Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. You see, Satan is a liar. He was a liar from the beginning. He's a liar in the middle. And he's going to be a liar at the end. And all along the way, he's trying to confuse uh, people when it comes to the truth of God's word. And as Paul is conveying to them, you need the truth and nothing but the truth, as he shared with them. He wanted them to believe the truth. The truth was that God loved them. God chose them. And God set them apart. And then call, God called them and gave them his glory as he concluded that. Then he wants them to guard the truth. There's a present danger of distorting the truth even in this day in which we live. From the first century, false doctrine, false teachers had been busy adding to the word of God, changing the word of God. And Paul wanted them to know the truth and guard the truth that was given. Remember that Thessalonians was written some 20 years after the ascension of Christ. So <clears throat> there was no uh, original writings. The word of God had not been written yet. So how did they know the truth? There were false doctors, false teachers, false people spreading lies and false doctrine. And Paul said, as he concluded with them and saying in verse 15, he said, Brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. In other words, Paul says it's by the preaching of the word that I've given to you. What did he do? Acts chapter 17. How did they know the truth? They couldn't read 1 Thessalonians. It wasn't written yet. They couldn't read any of the epistles. They weren't written yet. It was through the preaching of the word in Acts chapter 17. And then as he began to write under divine inspiration the word of God, he wanted them to know the truth 
by his epistles as he said to them in verse 15. Warren Wiersbe said this, he was not referring to man-made religious ideas that are not based on the word of God. He wants them to practice the truth. Practice this truth will comfort and establish your hearts and lives. It's by our lips and by our life. Listen to how he concludes in verse 17 of chapter 2. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So what do we do? We practice the truth. Someone said a sermon lived is a lot better than one preached. Well, we got to hear preached. But how much better it is when you walk out those doors and you live the truth of the Word of God. But when he comes to chapter 3, notice he says, finally, finally, brethren. And he gives a prayer for these Thessalonian believers. His prayer for them is this. He wants them to share the truth. You see, if we believe the truth and we guard the truth, we practice the truth, then we should share the truth. And that's what Paul is praying for them to do. Look in verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. What is he praying? His prayer for this church uh, and for these believers, these new converts, they, they had not been saved that long. He wants them to, to be able to share the truth of the word of God that's been given unto them. But it's interesting as Paul uses the word, brethren, pray for us. It's interesting that uh, Robertson's word studies of the New Testament tells us this word is in the present middle voice. In other words, that means it implies a continuous action of keep on praying. Hendrickson says it like this, that we need to pray constantly for us. In other words, Paul is not saying, well, just pray for me. He's wanting them to continue to keep on praying in, as he is implying in this verse. But I thought about what one person said. Why do we pray? In the midst of examining the power and the sovereignty of God, he says, we faced a temptation that has been a struggle for many Christians. We are tempted to think this way. If God is in control, why do I need to pray? Why should I worry about my obedience or my perseverance? God has this whole problem under control. We face temptation to become slack in our prayer life, in our obedience. Sometimes when we first see that God is in control of all things, our prayer life will often suffer and not remain consistent. In other words, we have this notion sometimes that we say, well, uh, if we just pray long and hard, that prayer will change things. But maybe uh, as we stop and think, uh, if we just keep praying and we keep praying, that maybe God is uh, going to do something God is going to heal me. Maybe God will change my problem. God will stop this virus. Uh, and we just more or less have that feeling that prayer is, if we can just get God to do what we want. If God will change the virus, heal me of this, give me a job, and if we'll just pray and pray and pray and pray hard enough, loud enough, long enough, that we can get God to do what we want. And God will straighten it out with our prayers. I like what Roger Nicole said. He said, I will be frank to confess. If I really thought I could change the mind of God by praying, I would abstain. How could I presume that the limitations of my own mind and the corruptions of my own heart, how can I presume to interfere in the counsels of the Almighty God? You see, we under, misunderstand prayer. Prayer is not to get God to do what you want. Prayer is to get us to do what God wants. Prayer is to find the mind of the Lord and say, Lord, what is your situation? God, what are you teaching me in this difficulty, in this hard time? God, what are you up to? Teach me thy way, O Lord. 
and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies, David said. Even our Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Oh, if it was up to me, I would have said, God, you can stop this virus a couple of months ago. That'd be good. And God, this is what you can do. I've got all kinds of good ideas. But you know, God's got a plan and a purpose, but he wants us to continue to pray. I like the illustration that someone gave about it's like going into a nuclear weapons facility. And maybe you know just a little bit about computers like I do. And you go into this nuclear uh, power facility and you say, well, let me start pressing a few buttons. I think I know how to get this under control and I think I know how to run this operation. You'd say, no way, Jose. But how God is in control of our lives. But yet to realize there is power in prayer. And Paul wants these early believers. He said, listen, you need to continue to keep on praying. It's not that we just pray one time and our problems will be over. It's not like we pray one time for our missionaries. Well, that's all they need. It's not like we pray one time during this virus and say, Lord, help us get through this. It's not like we're going through our problems and we just pray one time. No, Paul is saying to this church, Prayer is something that is a persistent and perpetual that we need to keep on praying. And that's why he shared with them earlier to pray without ceasing. Jesus himself said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Oh, listen, we need to continue in prayer. We need prayer during these days as we pray for one another and we constantly remind you to pray for your family, to pray for those in authority, to pray for our leadership, to pray for our country. Oh, listen, these are difficult days. And Paul is saying, listen, prayer is something that we need to continue to saturate the throne of God. We need to pray for one another and pray for God's will and pray for God to teach us some wonderful things in these days. But I call your attention as Paul talks about prayer and the persistence of prayer but notice what he's saying pray for what that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified what's the purpose in his prayer he's praying that the word of God the gospel the truth remember that truth that he wanted us to guard to believe to practice he wants that truth of the word of God to be able to be shared and to be spread abroad. He uses the word free course. It's interesting that he would use that word because it is an athletic term. In fact, Paul would use it throughout his epistles uh, often to give an illustration. And many commentators say that he possibly picked it up from the of Corinthian games or the Olympic games because he uses it again in a number of occasions in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 26 here, here's the same word it's the word I therefore so run not as uncertainty so fight I not as one that beateth the air he uses it again in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7 Ye did run well. It's like a runner in a race. It's like a runner uh, in a course. My grandson now is uh, running uh, long distance uh, for Maranatha. And I was talking with him the other day when I dropped him off at college. And uh, he was telling with me how that every day he's running and running. And, and I said, well, how you doing? He said, well, I'm eating more than I ever used to because I'm using up all this energy. And the coach said, I need to eat. So was, he said, I feel like I'm just eating and running, eating and running. But that's the thought that Paul is saying that as believers that were in a race, and he says he wants us to be able in this race to be able to be able to spread the good news of the gospel, to be able to share with others in these days in which we live. 
What is he praying for? He's praying for the gospel to have free course to be able to run and share and get out there. You know, it's very difficult, it seemed like, in these days in which we live. One of the things that I've struggled with as a pastor is to almost feel the restraint, the restraint of, of sharing the gospel and the good news. As there's so many limitations now of uh, telling you what not to do and, and, and trying to be safe, and we understand that, and we're trying to practice uh, safety guidelines in our church and in our school. But yet at the same time that we need to see that God wants the gospel to get out. That's what people need. They need the truth of the word of God. You see, they depended on their friends. They depended on alcohol. They depended on drugs. They depended on their social uh, f friends and fellowships and sports and activities. But now we need to share with them the good news of the gospel. And Paul is saying this. He said the prayer is not so much for personal blessings as it is for the progress of the gospel by the means of the work of God. His thought is this. Keep on giving out the gospel. And I would challenge to you as a church, keep on passing out tracts. And God convicted me the other day that I needed to do more. And I said, well, people won't take a tract. Well, offer it to them anyway. Leave a track, to leave a witness, to leave a good word, to share with others. Say, well, we can't invite people to church. Oh, yes, we can. And say, we're going to do everything you can. There's more people at Walmart, Menards, and Lowe's. And we can give them the gospel with the good news and social distance too. Oh, listen. Paul was praying that the gospel would not be hindered. Oh, let that gospel like a runner run in a race and share the good news of the gospel. You see, listen to what he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 12. Back in his previous, he said that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what else Paul is saying in verse 2. Paul's protection for the Thessalonians. Chapter 3 and verse 2. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith. You see, Paul is praying for the deliverance from evil men. You see, the word unreasonable means out of place. It means improper, injurious, wicked, harmful. In fact, I believe Paul had faced this opposition from wicked people many times in his ministry. In fact, you remember even in founding the church at Ephesus, I mean in Thessalonica, in Acts chapter 17, you remember there were some that believed and then the Jews that drove him out of town uh, to Berea. They followed him to Berea and then they gave him a hard time there. And then in Acts chapter 18, listen to what it says. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Now he's writing the book of Thessalonians from Corinth back to them. Now listen to what's going on at Corinth. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for their occupation. They were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified that, to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. What was he doing? He's running the race, spreading the gospel. He's sharing the good news. And the devil doesn't like it. And the devil's false teachers and false preachers, they don't like it either. 
And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. Henceforth I go unto the Gentiles. In other words, these unreasonable and wicked people seem like they didn't want to hear what Paul had to say. Isn't that true oftentimes in this day in which we live? As you have the truth, the world hates and despises when we tell and preach and give the truth of the Word of God. Have you ever seen such a day in which we live when Christians are hated and Christians are despised and Christians are made fun of, whether it be in Hollywood or on the media? Uh, and as Paul was saying, there are going to be wicked people that will stand against the truth. But Paul was saying, listen, I'm praying that you'll stand up for the truth. It may be on your job. It may be on our college campuses that they don't want to hear any but one side. It may be uh, on your job that people don't want to hear the truth. It may be that people will make fun of you. And as Paul, they blasphemed and made fun of him and didn't want to hear what he had to say. Again, it's important for you and I to share the truth whether people want to hear it or not in this wicked world in which we live. But not only does Paul pray that the truth of the word of God would be shared and that wicked people uh, would be hindered, but notice as he moves along, he says that they may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Now again, he goes a step further. He will keep you from evil. Now the implication here is not just evil in general. But the context you remember is Paul is speaking to the Thessalonians. He has talked about the wicked one. He's called him the wicked one. He's called him the man of sin. He's called him the son of perdition. And in fact, as we understand the implication of this word wicked, Paul uses it in a number of other occasions as he implies the evil one, the devil himself. In fact, listen to what he tells the believers in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 as he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Why? Here's what he says. And taking the shield of faith, whereby ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now again, the implication is of the wicked one, is of Satan himself. Again, you and I need to understand, Satan doesn't like the truth. And what is the context of the whole book of First and Second Thessalonians? is the liar, the evil one, the son of perdition. And what is he going to be doing in the last days? He's going to be the anti-Christ. He's going to be an imitator. He's going to be a liar. He's going to even fool the very elect and the nation of Israel. He's going to bring peace to this world. Can't you see how easy in the middle of this pandemic that the world would so readily run to uh, a, quote, Savior that would bring peace to solve the racial problem, to solve the Arab-Israeli problem, to solve the crime problem. And, and, and they'll run to somebody to say, bring peace, and they'll listen to this liar. Satan is a liar, and he hates the truth. He hates you, and he hates me. And it's encouraging to know that in these verses, Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica that God will keep you from the evil one. You see, Peter understood that danger. You remember in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, you remember when the Lord said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. 
And could I say that I believe that is true of every single believer? If you're living for the truth, guarding the truth, sharing the truth, Satan's goal, like Peter, is to bring you down. But the Lord said, Peter, I've prayed for you. It's interesting, would you look in this verse, the word keep, the word keep that Paul uses. This word keep, according to vine, means to guard or to keep watch by way of protection. In other words, it's used in Luke chapter 2. You remember that very familiar story of the shepherds? The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, they were watching over their flocks by night. What were they doing? These shepherds were guarding their sheep. And what is our shepherd doing? He's guarding us from the evil one. And that's why Peter never forgot when he told us in 1 Peter 5, 8, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be on guard for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And in these days in which we live, we have an evil one. He'll seek to take you out of church. He'll seek to take you out of the prayer closet like Peter should have been praying when he was sleeping. He'll seek to keep you out, get, get you out there in the world like Peter, you remember, warming himself at the fire uh, with the unbelievers when he should have been standing up for God. And Jesus was saying, Peter, Peter, I prayed for you. And our shepherd is guarding us in this wicked and ungodly day in which we live. And Paul said, he will keep you from the evil one. I'm glad that Paul said, greater is he that is in you than in he that is in the world. Paul called us more than conquerors through him that loved us. John called us, we're overcomers. And what did he tell them to do in Ephesians? To put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, in these difficult days in which we live, Satan hates our work. He seeks to hinder the gospel and the good news. He seeks to hinder you. He seeks to discourage you and bring you down. But we can rest assured that we have one that's praying for us, our shepherd that's guarding over us. And what does the sheep do when there's danger? You know what the sheep do? They just get up a little closer to the shepherd. And that's what we need to do in these days. But notice in this verse, as we come to verse 4, Paul's powerful command to the Thessalonians. He gives them a command. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things we command you. Warren Wiersbe tells us this. This word command, it's a military order passed down from a superior officer. In other words, those of you who have been in the military understand what a command is. It's not a suggestion. It's not a good idea, you know, when the captain or the general or whoever in charge said it would be a good idea, you know, if you did that. No, when you get a, a command, it is an order. It means to transmit a message. In fact, a number of times in the Bible, it's translated charge. Charge. It's used in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5 when the Lord Jesus Christ gave a command to his disciples. And he says, the twelve went forth. He commanded them, saying, these are your orders. This is what you are to do. Again, in Mark chapter 6, in verse 8, here's what the scripture says. And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, only a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse. Here's the commander in chief. Here's the way you're going into battle. You're going to go by faith. Paul picked up that word throughout his epistles. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 11, 
he said to Timothy, these things command and teach. It's a charge. It's an order. It's interesting as we look throughout Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he used that word quite a bit. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 2 and then verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4, he uses that word again, command. Chapter 3 and verse 6, he uses the word. Chapter 3 and verse 10, he uses this, we commanded you in verse 10. Look in verse 12 when he said, And now them are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. What was Paul commanding them to do? To continue to obey the words of the Lord. To share the good news of the gospel. To guard the truth. To practice the truth. To share the truth. It was a command. In other words, they had done it before and he's admonishing them to do it again. Listen to what he told them back in chapter 1 and verse 8. In 1 Thessalonians, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. What would Paul say to the church here at Calvary Baptist Church? Keep doing what you've been doing. Keep carrying the gospel. Oh, listen, there are hindrances in these days, but don't be put down. Don't let the devil, don't let wicked people, don't let the evil one hinder us from fully fulfilling our great commission. Paul said, this is a command. Keep doing it. You've done it before. And I believe you would say to Calvary Baptist Church, you've done it for all these years. Don't let a pandemic stop you. Don't let the devil stop you. Don't let wicked people in high places stop you. Don't let the unsaved world stop you. Keep running the race and getting out the good news of the gospel. You've done it before. Do it again. But he concludes his thoughts with his patience for the Thessalonians. Look in verse 5. Paul's patience for the Thessalonians. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Two things that he challenged them waiting for the King of Kings, the Commander in Chief to show up. One was the love of Christ. You see, any soldier knows that duty is a great part of his responsibility. He has a duty to perform, to do the commands that's given to him. And to a believer and a soldier of the cross, we have a duty to perform in the cause of Christ. But let me take it one step further. It goes beyond duty at times. As we see, Paul says, the love of Christ should constrain us. The love of Christ. Hendrickson said this. This love is strong. Sovereign. Unconditional. Never ending. And above all. Human comprehension. You see it's interesting. When he uses the word. The love of God. Again. Vine tells us. It's the subjective genitive. It's not their love for God but God's love for them that is men. Did you get that? When human hearts are directed to this love, obedience results. You see, when you stop and think as a soldier of the cross, the great love that God had for you, that should be our motivating factor. Our love for him fails. But when we think about his love for us, and I think about that song that we often sing, 
when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. He said, that cross reminds me of the love of God for me. We have a cross in our auditorium. We have a cross on the outside. It's an empty cross, but it is a cruel cross. And it reminds us not of our love for God. It reminds us of God's love for us. And Paul was saying to these early Thessalonians, let me remind you of God's love for you. When you get out there in the battlefield, the bullets are flying and it's hard. You're in the middle of a pandemic and fear and doubt and difficulties. You lose your job. You lose your finances. And yea, you might even lose your health. Just think of the cross and the love of God for you. And then he turns. And he talks about their patience. Unto the patient waiting for Christ. Now the patience that he's talking about here is not like you're sitting in the dentist office and you're waiting for the dentist and you're kind of nervous and you're ready to get this over with. That's not the patience that he's talking about. The, pa the word patience there means endurance. Strong says it means a cheerful, hopeful endurance. That even in difficult times, we are going through hard times in these days in which we live. It has hit our country and our city and our church and our families more than any other time. But we can endure these adverse circumstances, these difficult times, knowing that God will be with us and that we can trust Him and endure and go through this, not in our own strength, but in His power and in His might. It's no wonder that James would say to us, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. As we wait for the Lord to come, wouldn't it be a shame if he came in the middle of this pandemic and we had given up? Wouldn't it be a shame if the Lord came and said we had quit witnessing, we had quit going to church, we had quit praying. Lord, it was just too hard. It was just too difficult. But God wants us to endure and wait and expect his return. Because we love him. Because we love him. I recently read the story about Sam Mendes. Sam Mendes heard the story of his grandfather that would tell stories about World War I. And he said it was late in his 70s that his grandfather began to tell him some of these old war stories. And he said this, he was very young, and very small, but he was very fast. He was given the job of carrying messages across the front lines. He said one of the missions of his grandfathers was to carry word across what they called no man's land. No man's land in World War I was that area where there was no protection. Because his grandfather was small, he said they used him to send with him messages because his, his grandfather was just a little over five feet. The mist would hang around six feet in no man's land. And it wasn't uncommon, as you know, in that day to have the wires cut and the poor communication. So often they depended upon human messengers to get the word out. And he said he enjoyed hearing the stories that Sam did of his father as he would risk his life to get one message to another and what needed to be done in the time of battles. And I would say to you and to me today, we're in a battle, we're in a conflict. Sure, it's dangerous. The devil doesn't like us. The world doesn't like us. Evil people and false teachers don't like us. But we have been given a command to 
get the word out. And Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, you did it once, keep doing it, and do it again. And I would challenge you today as messengers of the gospel and the good news, we have nothing but the truth. We need to guard it. We need to protect it. We need to practice it. And we need to share it. Oh, it's dangerous, all right. But we have the shepherd who's guarding us. Would you bow with me in prayer? I don't know where you are. I don't know if you know the Lord, if you're saved or unsaved. But your greatest need is to know the good news of the gospel that Jesus saves. And if you don't know him today, I would invite you to put your faith and trust in him. That God so loved the world that he came to this world and died on a cruel cross. And as we look to that empty cross, we see the good news of the gospel. God's love. And when you and I would go out to this world that is our enemy. And they'll seek to take us down. They'll seek to oppose us. But you know what? We can be reminded of God's love. We can endure through these hard times because of his love for us. And we can fulfill the great commission and the charge, the command. Not the great suggestion. It's the great commission that God has commanded us to give the gospel. Father, help us in these days to be good soldiers of the cross. Oh, we're being shot at. We're being made fun of. Oh, Lord, it's hard. And sometimes we even get wounded. But Lord, help us to be obedient, to share the good news, share the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.